everybody, it's Shelby from Stang Books, and it's that time again. It's time for my week in review. This was a busy week, but yet I still managed to get in back to my normal reading habits, so there's quite a long list of books to go through today, so I'm going to jump right in and get to it. The first three books that I read this week actually were still part of the Diversathon. I was really happy to finish up my entire list of planned books I wanted for the Diversathon, and I got through the last three, like, right down at the wire. So the first book I read this week was Casket of Souls. It's the sixth book in the Night Runner series by Len Fleming. This was a five-star read. I love this series. It's a fantastic fantasy series. And it's, this was a great continuation that kind of took both Alec and Saragal, our main characters, back to the original first couple books in the series and is a lot more political intrigue than some of the darker fantasy elements that we've had in the last two books. In this book, Alec and Saragal have returned to Rimini and are back to being the dissolute noblemen that they are in town. Nobody knows their secret life as spies and night runners. They're just two low-level kind of aristocrats within the court. But at night, things go a little bit differently. So with them back in town, the Rimini cat is up to his old tricks again, being hired to be able to do a fair bit of thievery. While there are two factions building in Rimini, one that wants to see the succession happen the way that it is currently established, and the other that wants Clea to take over as queen. Queen Foria has two sisters. One, Princess Clea, is in charge of the military. She would much rather be on the front lines with her soldiers. And on the other side, her other sister has a daughter that Queen Foria has named as her heir. Alec and Saragel stumble across the plot, at least pieces of the plot, and are trying to piece together what is really going on and who's really involved. Meanwhile, there is a plague rising in the city, and people are suddenly dropping dead in a waking death kind of state where they are completely unresponsive, but they may live for a few more days in this kind of brain-dead state. And Alec and Sarah Gell have a lot of friends in the lower classes and are trying to figure out exactly what's going on, as they're still trying to figure out who is set on trying to kill off the queen and or Princess Clea, depending on which side you were on. This was a really, really fantastic read. It's a lot of court intrigue and who's on whose sides, and you get little hints and pieces of things. Just a really fantastic book. It was really nice to see everyone back home in Rimini and back in the world that we first got introduced to. And it moved along the story really nicely and it put a few characters with, with things that you've been waiting for. They finally happened in this book. And it just was a great, great story. I really, really enjoyed this. I found it immensely satisfying. And it's just a great fantasy series. I love this world. And as part of the Diversathon, this book really does deal with class and how where your class matters with the plague is only killing off people in the lower um, society. And the upper echelon and the nobility want to just close off those parts of the city and just pretend kind of like it's not happening and it doesn't affect them. And the, Sarah Gill and, and um, Alec are our eyes and ears on both sides. And so you get to kind of see what it means to be a noble, but also what it means to be someone who is... Uh, a beggar or one of the prostitutes and how the world differs for each of them and how status really affects the life in this world. The second book that I read was Femme by Marshall Thornton. This was a three-star read for me. It is a male-male romance and the thing about this book was I really loved the way it was looking at the dichotomy of the different types of gay stereotypes. Um, but it was really sadly lacking in the romance department. The characters were really interesting. I loved the character of Lionel. I thought he was fantastic. He's this totally queeny, over-the-top gay man, flaming gay, absolutely out there. Um, and he was just really fun and funny and you liked his personality and his character. And then on the other side, you had Dog, who is a gay man who has been in the closet most of his life and really is only out to a small group of people. He plays on a gay softball league, 
And that was his way of finally getting to be in a place where he felt accepted. Well, he's very butch, he's very uh, straight acting and straight passing. He makes a lot of mistakes when it comes to Lionel. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum and the way that they look at being gay and the way that they interact with each other is affected by those perceptions. It makes Lionel question a lot of things about his own self and should he need to change. And it also, there's a, a path of dog coming to understand and accept Lionel for who he is. The problem is that while Lionel's journey was really interesting and he actually tries to pass at times and um, makes an attempt at, at figuring out who he is and what he really wants and how to just be himself and be comfortable with himself, dog is constantly making the wrong choice. And it doesn't make sense in the book to me why Lionel keeps letting him back in and doesn't just say you've screwed up too many times and he does make a big gesture it does come out well I get it it was it that part was really nice but he had hurt him so many times as an openly admitted gay man like to himself he has no problems admitting that he's a gay man he had a lot of prejudice towards a gay man like Lionel and it leads to a lot of problems in the first part of their relationship. And I just didn't find him very redeeming with each of those instances, and I couldn't understand why Lionel would just let it go. So overall, it was only a three-star read for me. I loved the way that the two gay sides of the gay spectrum were depicted. I liked the way the characters were utilized. I just didn't feel like the romance part of the story really gelled and worked well together. My third and last book for the Diversathon was Quiet the Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. I gave this five stars. This book was incredible. It is a nonfiction book and it is a book that looks at the difference between being an introvert and an extrovert in today's society, how the world looks at introverts and extroverts, and also how U.S. culture has made the idea of being an introvert something to be looked down on and there's a stigma attached to being an introvert versus being an, being an extrovert. And that there is a perception in the United States that to get ahead, one must be an extrovert. And you must be able to be this open, gregarious person. And I find that really fascinating as somebody who is completely an introvert and works in an extrovert world and the different things that I've had to learn to do myself to be able to function within my career and the in film and television because it is a world that expects you to be able to go to parties and be social and talk to people and be totally open and just go for it and being someone who is by nature quieter and it is a learned skill. And this book literally looks at it from a scientific and um, socio socio sociology perspective, analyzing how it works in business and with kids, the development is being an introvert or an extrovert something that is innate? Is it by nature? How does everything play together? And I listened to this on audio. It was a fantastic listen, but I've since decided I really want to get a physical copy of this book so I can kind of make notes and note things because this book spoke to me like you wouldn't believe. I was reading it going, yes, that is me, that is me, that is me, that is me, that's how I feel. And it was just really an incredible read very well written of uh, the perspective of this woman who is an introvert and was a lawyer, a very successful lawyer, and in doing this research kind of moved her way into doing something that felt more natural for her and public speaking terrifies her and she's had to learn to do it as an author and someone who speaks on introvertism. Um, I just, I really love this book. I mean, one of the things I found most fascinating in listening to it is they did this whole study of what, of how people, um, work in teams and, and put together groups and they took a groups and they said put an extrovert in charge of a group of um, self-starters and an extrovert in charge of a group of people that are more followers and then vice versa they put an introvert in charge of the self-starters and an introvert in charge of the um, followers and did the study to see which groups produced better over a mean average. And they found that, in general, extrovert, an extrovert leader does push people to do better and to function on a faster pace and accomplish more. But when you had the case of an introvert leader over a team of go-getters, they actually did even better than the extrovert-led teams. In large part, the reason being that that introvert leader will listen to everyone else's ideas, take it all, filter it 
and give it all thought and then come up with the best plan to utilize moving forward. So while it may take those teams a little bit longer to get started, overall they have a better, more productive, full path and plan that takes them to greater heights than the extrovert-led team did. I just found it really fascinating to look at the way that different people lead and what it means to be a leader and how perception affects what we think as, as a country and as a people. So really, really fascinating book. I recommend everyone should read this book. It was just incredible. I, I really loved it. And like I said, I really want to get a physical copy of this book because I want notes. <laughs> After the ending of the Diversathon, I read another six books, I think. I think I had nine books total this week. And the first of those was Natural Instincts by S.J. Frost. It is the first book in the Instinct series. I gave it a three and a half stars. This is a vampire paranormal male male romance. There are parts I liked about this series and the story and then parts I didn't like. It actually left me wanting to read book two more than I enjoyed book one. I really like the characters that they introduced that you know are going to be book two. This story is about Andreas de Condros and his sister has recently died and he is convinced that she's been killed by her lover, Renard, that he has been told is a vampire. So he goes into Renard's bar to kind of do some reconnaissance because he knows as a human he can't kill him. He doesn't have the ability. So he wants to find somebody to become his master and turn him. And on his way into the bar, he catches eyes with this guy outside and just kind of dismisses it. But later, when Renard throws him out of the bar and leaves him to his minions, this same guy shows up and saves him. Well, this is Titus Antonius Caldus. And Titus has been around since as evidenced by his name, the Greek and Roman days. He's one of the ancients, and the ancients have more power than younger vampires because in this version of vampirism, the longer that you are alive, the more power that you have. So Titus is drawn to Andreas. He makes a deal with Andreas. If he can come and live with him for a month and be his lover at the end of the month, he still wants to be a vampire, then Titus will turn him. Of course, this is a romance, so the relationship between them, it's this insta-love connection, which doesn't bother me as much in Paranormal as it does with other stories, because in the Paranormal, there's that already that fantastical element that if these two meet, I kind of get a, can accept that suddenly they looked at one another and it was just BAM! It was an interesting relationship. I liked the way the world was structured. The plot was kind of minor to what was going on. This was really about Andreas and Titus and what was going on between them. And it was just, it was an okay, it was a good read. I enjoyed it, but I wasn't like raving about it. I'm really curious to read about Daniel and Ryu because they were introduced in this book and I liked their characterization better. Anyway, I, I definitely will read the next book in the series and see if that keeps my interest. But it was fun, it was enjoyable, it was a quick read, nothing too long. Just not as deep as I would have liked it. The next book I read was Sense of Place by N.R. Walker. This is the third book in the Thomas Elkin series, the third and final book in the Thomas Elkin series. And I didn't love this series when it first started out. It has a very significant age difference between the two main characters, and I don't like large age gaps. It's one of my few pet peeves, and there is a 22-year age difference between Thomas and Cooper. So in the first book, it bothered me. I think I only gave the first book, like, three stars. I liked the characters, but the age gap just kept tripping me out, and every book has gotten better and better. So this last book, I actually did give five stars. It was a wonderful wrap-up of these two and their story. At this point I kind of accept their relationship because that's who they are and we've had three books now to get used to it. They love each other and that's a very apparent in what's going on. But this book brings to a head all of the little threads throughout the story. It's the two of them, well really more Thomas than Cooper. Cooper's always been okay with their age difference, but Thomas wasn't. He struggled with it. And this story is about him finally fully accepting their relationship. It's their families fully accepting their relationship. And them moving into places in their career where they're really happy to be at and making some changes that are better for them moving forward. So this was a really lovely story. It wrapped a lot of things up. The whole series is very short. I think each book is maybe 100 pages. They're not really long at all. You could probably put all three of them together in one book, it would have been fine. But I really enjoyed the series. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, and the characters are what the story is about. And I really, by the end of it, was really behind Thomas and Cooper as a couple. Next, I had a book I really loved. This was recommended to me for a challenge that I kind of had to read this book this month. It was not on my radar at all. It was incredible. It was called A Fortunate Blizzard by L.C. Chase. I gave this a full five stars. I sobbed through this book. I just had tears streaming down my face. But it's an incredibly emotional read and for once an insta-love book worked for me. I think part of it is because it is a holiday book. It is set at Christmas. Um, you already kind of have that softening of your emotional vibe and feeling and you'll kind of accept anything because it's the holidays. So in this book Trevor Morrison is a painter and an artist. He's very successful lives up in the mountains of Colorado because of that's his inspiration. He is dying. He has um, kidney failure. He's been on the transplant list for years. He's been doing dialysis regularly and now his kidneys have started to fail again. And it's Christmas time and he's supposed to be getting back to go see his family for Christmas but there's a massive snowstorm blowing in. Meanwhile on the other side of town in Denver is our lovely Marcus Roberts. Now Marcus is a lawyer. He is very, very committed to his work. He's given up everything else in his life. He had a very tempestuous relationship with his family and they kicked him out essentially for being gay. And he has put all of his focus in trying to prove himself to gain his mother's respect even though he hasn't talked to her in over 10 years. So this snowstorm is blowing in and his secretary basically throws him out of the office and says, you need to get home or you are not going to make it home and you do not need to spend your holiday here snowed in. So get your butt home. And of course, on his way home on the freeway, it, the snowstorm is so bad, the plows can't get through and everything and the state patrol is kind of telling people to pull their cars over and there's a motel across the street and they should just go and wait out the storm in this motel. So Marcus gets a room. He is enjoying a hot cup of brandy beverage, you know, some warmed alcohol with a little bit of cold going on when the most handsome man he's ever seen wanders in the door and can't get a room at the end because it's overbooked, which of course this is Trevor. This is a beautiful love story between two men and I don't care that it happens that quickly because the emotion in these pages was there. I just bought into the fact that they instantly fell in love with each other because their actions were all about being in love and caring about the other person and the choices that they made really showed that that was the case and that they really cared. And I'm not kidding, there were just waterworks and streaming and I'm sitting there like wiping my eyes so I can keep reading the pages because it was so good. I, I just really love this book. The writing was lovely. It's not a super long book, it's pretty short, but it was a great holiday Christmas story that you could get behind and feel good and just make your heart go pity pat. The next book I read was Bone Crossed by Patricia Briggs. And this is the fourth book in the Mercy Thompson series. I gave this four and a half stars. I really love this series. I think it's really great. They're a wonderful paranormal series about Mercy Thompson. She is a Native American coyote shifter and hers is like a shamanic shamanic powers kind of. It's innate in her bones. Her nature as a coyote is very different than the werewolves in this book. The werewolves have a much more force change and the pack hierarchy and her being a coyote is a totally different style of magic. So this book starts up almost right after, it's like very short time after the book before this end. It's only been a couple of weeks. And in the last book, um, Mercy was raped and kidnapped by this really nasty guy. So this book was really dealing with, especially in the first part of it, her PTSD and how she feels after having gone through all of this. Um, and it really moves her relationship with Adam forward, the alpha of the werewolf pack. And all of that is kind of a subplot to everything else that's going on because there are issues with the vampires. The queen of the vampires, Marsilia, well, she's the queen of the vampires in that area. She's not the queen overall. There's like higher powers than her. But she's like the head of the seed. Um, she's found out that Mercy had, was really the one that killed some of her vampires. And so she tortures and basically almost kills one of her subordinates, uh, Stefan, who's friends with Mercy and was involved in covering it up. So Stefan just is essentially dumped into 
Mercy's living room, almost dead, in the middle of Mercy and Adam kind of talking and deciding on things in their relationship because Adam wants to claim Mercy as his mate and she's been a very hesitant. She was raised by werewolves and she doesn't know that she wants to be part of a pack. This book is a lot of Mercy figuring out what's going on with the vampires and there's more to the plot than meets the eye and she is trying to figure out her place within the pack and what she wants from Adam and admitting to herself finally that she really does love Adam and she really does want to be with him. And this was just, it was a great book in that how it handled her trauma from the book previous and um, just everything that she's dealing with and going on and ties up some loose ends from before, introduces some new themes. It was just a really fun book. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I really like her as a character, which is unusual for me. I don't normally like series books that just go on and on and there's like... 10 books in the series when it's all one character. But I'm really enjoying this one so far. I think it's a lot of fun. So. The next book I read this week was Crucible of Fate. It's the fourth book in Mary Calm's uh, Change of Heart series. And again, this was a four and a half star read for me. I've really enjoyed this series as a whole. And Mary Calm's can be kind of hit or miss for me. This book was a good continuation of the series. It switches our focus off of the main two characters that we followed up until now. And is kind of a side story with one of the alphas. Domin Thorn. Or Domin. Domin. I'm terrible with pronunciations. So. Okay, I'm getting a ton of shadows and light right now because the sun is behind the tree outside my apartment window. And it is coming in in like the most random light patterns. So, weird light and shadow, sorry. Um, Domin is taken over as the Seminole Ten in Sobek, and this story is a were-panther story. It's very much based in Egyptian mythology. The heart of this were-panther nation is in Egypt. And at the end of the last book, there was a challenge for rulership due to a lot of complicated things, and Domin won. But he has no idea what he's doing. He's just been thrown to this. He's an American, and these clans have been there for centuries, and this whole hierarchy structure of the priests and his um, advisors and these Egyptian clans that aren't so excited to have an outsider suddenly in charge. So there is a whole subsection that want to see him outed and a different where Panther put in charge, and so those factions are conspiring to overthrow Domin. This book was great because we got to see all of our favorite characters coming into play, but it, it's really a story of Domin accepting who he is, who he loves, what he wants, and coming into his own as a leader, as an alpha, accepting that part of himself again because his past has led him to doubt it, and now he really has to take control, and that it's okay to change tradition, that it is okay to say these things are no longer valid and the rules that are in place are detrimental to us as a society and I am going to now take the Were Panthers into the 21st century. I enjoyed this book. There were little things in it that irritated me um, as far as why it got knocked down a half star. It's a very hard book to pick back up when I hadn't read much in the series recently because I took me a little while to get into it. I couldn't remember exactly what happened. There are a ton of names and titles in this and it matters to what's going on and not knowing what a title means and they're all in like um they're very specific to this book and i'm sure have some tie into like egyptian culture or something that i just don't know enough about to know but if you don't remember what a semelaten is then every time they use the word you're going oh crap what does that mean again and each of his like advisors has a different title and each of the challengers has a different title so it became a little confusing in the beginning especially because I read the last book like six months ago. Um, but overall, the story was fun. It really solidified a lot of things, settled them into who they are and what they want, and took things to the next path for the Panthers. My last book this week was actually a short and combined two series I really, really enjoyed. They're, I, I love both these authors. They're fantastic. This book was called Remnant, a Caldwell and Fleximal, Will I Born and Griffin Mystery. It's the third book in the Secret Case book of Simon Fexmal, written by K.J. Charles, and the uh, 3.5 book in Wyborn and Griffins, written by Jordan L. Hawk. 
This was such a brilliant idea. Both of these worlds are set in late 1800s. Um, this book actually takes place in 1899. And they're both paranormal MM romances about the same couple in every book. And I love both of them. The Secret Case Book of Simon Feximal is actually a collection of shorts. Um, none of those books are super overlong versus Wyborn and Griffin is full length novels. And I, Wyborn and Griffin is one of my favorite paranormal romances, especially for a historical. I just, I love it. Um, so in this, the, with the secret case book of Simon Vexmal, you have Simon Vexmal and Robert Caldwell, and they are a pair of ghost hunters in London. And Simon has a unique power to be able to speak to the um, ghosts of the dead. Robert, it's kind of like a Sherlock Holmes and Watson situation between the two men. Of course, they are, are in love with each other. And they have a new case. And people have been dying around London in very mysterious circumstances. But the problem is when Simon utilizes his powers, what happens is that what the ghost has to say is written in print and ink across his chest. Well, this time it's written in Egyptian hieroglyphics, like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, and they have no way of reading it. They don't understand it, so it's having a really hard time solving the cases. Meanwhile, on a steamer ship coming in from the Americas are Dr. Percival Endicott Wyborn and Griffin Flatterty. These two are two of my favorite, like, love the couple. Um, Percival is a scholar. He works in a museum. He spends his entirety of time translating ancient languages. He is a nerd. An utter nerd. Well, he has sorcerer powers, but he likes to think of it as just science that's not explained. So he doesn't, he's still trying to figure out why his spells work when he just has the spell book and he can actually make fire and those kinds of things and he doesn't know why, but he he is convinced that it can't actually be magic. There has to be some scientific explanation. But he's a total nerd and a klutz. He met in the first book Griffin Flatterty, who is a who used to be a detective with the Pinkerton Detectives Agency. And Pinkertons were in the United States history the precursor to the FBI. They were like the first national kind of detectives. And um, he came across a paranormal case that no one believed him had occurred. He left and has become a private detective in Wyborn's hometown. They met on the first big paranormal case there and have since solved a couple of crazy paranormal episodes. So they are on a steamership bound for London to look into uh, translating an Egyptian tablet. Simon is convinced that the arrival of Percival is what is causing things. He's convinced this guy is a necromancer and he's raising the dead and he's causing all of these problems and so they are going to spy on Percival and Griffin. Well of course they're the good guys and so the two of them together they are going to solve this mystery. The best part of this book was the characters and the way they interacted and seeing these two fandoms essentially, not even fandoms, but these these two worlds and these two authors worlds collide and written together and done in such a beautifully mastered way. I would love to see another crossover book with these guys because the interplay between the four men was really funny and interesting and there's a battle of wills between them all. Just really, really fascinating and so well done. I loved this book. It was a great little short. I gave it four stars. Just super fun. Really, really fun historical paranormal mystery. That is my week in review. If you've read any of these books or have any thoughts, please let me know down in the comments below. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. It was a really great week reading for the Diversathon, and I really felt like I, I got through some things that I, I wouldn't necessarily have gotten to as quickly, um, especially Quiet. I mean, Quiet just really, really made my month. I can't, I am so happy I read that book. And I don't think I would have gotten to it as quickly without the Diversathon. So just really amazing. Great week of reading. I can't wait to keep moving on and love to know what y'all think. Have a great day. Bye.